So people slowly trickling in. Kia ora koutou katoa, no mai, hare mai. Welcome to another Toei Caucus webinar on another Friday. It's a cold winter's day. And before we get started, we'll just start ourselves, um, or we'll just centre ourselves with a karakia. Whakataka te hau ki te uru. Whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mā kina kina ki uta. Kia mā tara tara ki tai. Ehi ake ana te atakura. He tio, he huka, he hau hu. So, kia ora, welcome and acknowledging all of you who are joining us from many different parts of the country. And if you're um, ready to engage with the chat, maybe jump in the chat and let us know where you're from, who you are and where you're from. Just a reminder with Zoom on chat, it does automatically just put you to all panellists, which is us three. Um, so if you want to talk to all everyone, select all panellists and edit in these next to the two. Um, We'll just do a brief introduction of ourselves before we get into um, our formal presentation. So I'll hand it over to you, Jono. Cool. Uh, e sila vi inga male anga lei male lofa male falo ala ni tato wa tua. Uh, o te fata lofa atu lupa ia male malo tato au le ngai. Uh, lo ingo i o ngā kanga sedu, au te samme au te langi sifo, lo ka male sa molo ki ngā lupa langi tā lofa, tā lofa laba. So, hey everyone, uh, my name is Jono. I'm Selu. I currently work for the Mental Health Foundation of New Zealand as a health promoter, um, but I have a background in um, sexual violence prevention and um, comprehensive sexuality education. Um, I am excited to be here. I'm a little bit lost for words as well, <laughs> um, but I can't wait to crack into it. I'm born and bred out in West Auckland, um, half Samoan, half Balangi. Um, and I'm going to be talking a lot, I guess, throughout this, so you'll hear more from me as we go. Um, so, awesome. Thank you, Miriam, for having me along. Over to you, Evan. Yeah, kia ora. I'm Evan, originally from the States, been in Aotearoa now for a year. I'm working as the Artistic Director of Theta, the Theatre and Health Education Trust, and I look after our uh, SexWise program, which is a uh, full primary prevention and comprehensive uh, healthy relationships and sexuality education. Uh, and I'm also a um, registered drama therapist. Right. And Kira Koto, I don't normally um, introduce myself formally because I'm not often the presenter in these spaces, but um, today we're actually co-presenting the three of us. So um, you've often seen me, for those who are new in this space, um, my name is Miriam Joy Assessa. I am part English, part Italian, and have been in Aotearoa for um, 14 years now. And I have um, a background in gender-based violence prevention and intervention, so I've been working in this space for approximately 20 years. And so lots of this work I was thinking about, in particular around facilitation. I started my first workshops um, when I was 14 in lots of student advocacy spaces. So I um, have been thinking about groups and in particular group dynamics for a long time in particular. I was really curious when I was younger around that, how very well-meaning people often go into quite um, dysfunctional groups. So that fascinated me for a long time. So I'm seeing lots of great people um, popping in the chat um, from all sorts of different parts of the country. So we'll get started in sharing our slides. Can just double checking that we've got the technology working? Yes. Always love it when technology works. So this is the first part of two sessions. Um, and in today's session, these are the, the kind of learning objectives. So over the two sessions, these are the learning objectives that we will be covering, covering sorry. The first is creating safe learning environments using facilitation, co-facilitation, communication skills by projecting calm, confident and positive persona. The second is recognizing different emotional states in group settings and manage them to ensure safety and well-being of participants. The next one is to engage with target groups using participatory teaching methods, modeling consent and relating respectfully. And then the last um, learning objective is a sensitivity to the complexities of power, authority and privilege within the context of Aotearoa New Zealand. Um, just a brief mention on these learning objectives. They do come from the Capability Framework to Tuanest or Teo Akiahine National Network Ending Sexual Violence Together Tui Caucus developed in 2017. And we'll be talking a brief bit about some of the research around that but the full report will be sent to you via email. So we won't go into depth around that and the kind of key 
three key learning areas um, are where those, those um, learning objectives came from. And in today's session, we'll be doing a brief introduction around prevention. And that's just a context setting. Um, we'll be doing an overview of understanding trauma, just so we all have a, a baseline of what does trauma mean. We'll be going more in depth into trauma-informed facilitation and what it looks like in action. And that's what we're doing today. So, brief introduction to sexual violence prevention. Um, John and, and Evan, do either of you want to help me out here in terms of what what sexual violence prevention? How do we do it? You go, Evan. <laughs> yeah. So, um, of course, let's let's stop it before it ever happens, right? Um, and that that would be primary prevention. So and that has to do with. Um, with building the capacity to have uh, kind of a safe uh, space where, where people are honored and respected in their relationships and, and sexual encounters. Um, but you can see that, that that is the foundation of the pyramid, um, but there's other layers to it as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, there's also different opinions around um, what actually fits into secondary and tertiary prevention. There's a lot of debate. So for me, you know, that exactly what Evan said around, you know, trying to stop things before they happen is in the primary. Some of the debates around secondary, whether it's um, early intervention with problematic or worrying behaviours um, and intervening in that or actually intervening in the crisis situation. So when something has just happened and then tertiary is either that, you know, some people actually put the crisis response in the tertiary or the long-term therapy and recovery in the tertiary. So it's... Um, it comes from a public health model and it does give us some good founding. So today we're, we are thinking about education in that primary prevention setting is where we're with the context of trauma-informed facilitation for today. Oops, sorry, I'm trying to click and it's not working. So there's, um, we're quite fortunate, I think, now that there's an, an increased growth of literature around primary prevention. And this is from um, just a systemic review that came out in 2014, where they, they reviewed over 140 different um, evaluation for prevention activities and came up with these eight kind of key aspects that need to be a part of all prevention strategies. So the first that it's comprehensive and that often comprehensive is multi-layered eh, of going, it's not just targeting an individual, it's thinking the individual and the whole system, that it's appropriately timed that it utilizes varied teaching methods, is administrated by well-trained staff. And that's often a tension, I think, when people aren't specialists thinking that this is simple stuff that just gets picked up and you just pop into a class or a group and talk about some things, when actually it's quite a complex skill set that preventionists need to hold. And provide opportunities for positive relationships outside of a formal education setting um, where social was socially cultural relevant was theory driven and included outcome evaluation and the three kind of key areas we'll be focusing on today are these three um, and we will um, send lots of these resources out via email afterwards together with the powerpoint so don't feel that we're just skimming over things and that you're not going to capture enough do any of you um, John or Evan, did you want to go into more depth of either of these? Um, I'll touch on the, the socioculturally relevant um, real quickly, because I think, I think that's an, a, really, a really important uh, component to consider when we're talking about the space. Um, a lot of the professional, professional um, requirements on people and helping professions talks about um, cultural competency. Um, and personally, I... I get really concerned when we start talking about cultural competency because it becomes tick boxy. Whereas culturally relevant um, is about actually being responsive to the room that you walk into. So, you know, walking into a room in a, a South Auckland school is going to look very different to the way that you walk into a, a room in, say, um, uh, Invercargill um, because your, your contexts are going to look different. So, when we're talking about that socioculturally relevant, I think that's a really useful framing to think about because we're really starting to dig into, yes, actually, how do I be responsive to the classroom we're walking into? And I think for me, that ties across to a lot of the other components of um, 
the kind of key messages or key learnings from the um, from that uh, systemic sy yeah systemic review um, around using varied teaching methods. Um, staff actually knowing what they're talking about when they walk into spaces and feeling confident in that in those conversations um being able to be comprehensive and appropriately timed um and in, in a lot of ways also being theory driven um i guess that's kind of i don't want to keep talking too much on this because i think we're going to do a lot of that throughout the rest of the webinar i don't want to give away all of the webinar in the first five minutes um <laughs> even anything else you wanted to add in yeah. no, i think the key the key thing here is that that these things we're seeing um are supported by research that's what the systemic reviews findings are reinforcing. Absolutely. Yeah. And just to note, um, further in, in, um, in the cultural understanding of, um, of prevention, um, and this is from my colleagues in Kātiaki Māori and not wanting to take um, anything of theirs because we're not, we're not qualified to talk to this, but really wanting to highlight that prevention education is one form of prevention and for example for our, our colleagues in Naikati Kimari, funnel order is actually the primary driver of preventing um, harm within Māori communities. So um, really underpinning and thinking about who are we and how do we best address the harm of the community that we're trying to serve and that will look differently in different spaces. So um, just a, a note before we jump into the activity, um, and we've given a little bit of an intro around sexual violence and really wanting people to check in with themselves for a moment um, to think about, if for those, you know, there's over 100 people in, in the webinar right now and there's a lot of activity in, um, in the chat. So really thinking into how you're feeling and we're going to pop into the chat also a support service just to go, actually, we've just talked about a whole lot of sexual violence stuff. For some of you, this is really normal bread and butter, everyday experience. And for others, this might be new content. So just for a moment, feel into your own well-being. And if anyone is feeling that they do need extra support either now or after the session, we'll just pop in um, the Safe to Talk link so that you can check in with them later. Well done. And now um, we're going to pop another link into the chat, which is for a word cloud. And, and we talk a lot about trauma informed. It's a, it's a buzzword in our field. But what does it really mean? Um, what is trauma informed facilitation? Uh, so let's, let's uh, respond to this. You'll just click on it. It'll take you to another site and you'll, you'll enter your response to this what is trauma informed and then we we'll watch the word cloud as it forms uh, in front of us so hopefully um we haven't got any responses yet so hopefully you can get into the chat and the link um oh here it comes well done People have been able to follow the link. So I'll just share this as it's growing. So we've only got six responses, seven. Keep, keep on the words coming. Oh, it's quite fun to watch, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Mesmerizing. Even as it grows, empathy stays at the core. Yeah. Yeah. We draw it to a close there, you reckon? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for your 
Thanks for your input. I mean, it looks like we're it looks like we're all speaking about the same stuff here. Looking at the word cloud. Wow, it's quite quite a quite a lot of different um, words, isn't it? In terms of um, like all the smaller pieces as well. But that empathy and understanding and safety really come come in the center. So I'll just swap screens, sorry. So it sounds like as a group, you, you already have a bit of understanding around trauma and trauma-informed practice. Um, and so now we're just going to do a very brief overview of what some of the definitions are. So um, we're, we're going to start off with a video um, that Tawn has developed a couple of years ago now. So... And has a frightening experience. Sorry. Person has a frightening experience where they feel they have no control and their lives are in danger, such as during a car crash. We may be more likely to be traumatized when we witness or experience harm by another person through verbal, sexual, physical harassment or violence. This can affect all of our interpersonal relationships. To understand a person's response to violence, we need to consider their past experiences and culture. Different people will experience trauma in different ways due to normal reactions in the brain. One of the brain's main jobs is to keep us safe, to scan our environment and react to threats and danger. What we all have in common is that the thinking brain, which deals with thoughts, planning and communication, is usually in charge. If the brain senses danger and sets off an alarm, then the emotional part of the brain takes over for protection and survival. We share this alarm system with animals. Common reactions are fight, flight, freeze, flop or friend as their body and brain goes into survival mode. Stress hormones flood the system, heightening the senses and affecting the ability to take in information, motion and memory. After a traumatic event like sexual or family violence, the brain may replay a jumble of thoughts, feelings and sensations as it tries to find meaning and make sense of what happened. People can have a range of feelings and the impacts on the brain can make it hard to reach out for support. Even if they can share their experience, feelings of shame and confusion can make it hard to talk about sexual violence. These feelings can be influenced by a person's history of trauma, culture, language and community and in normal reactions to an abnormal situation. Reaching out for support and avoiding isolation is important. Talking and connection can both help. Identifying ways a person can feel safe, secure, supported and connected helps the nervous system relax, become calm and start their healing journey. Yeah. Um, so as that as that video showed, um, the trauma can come from a number of different sources. It's of course most severe when it's interpersonal, um, but the lingering effects of that of that trauma are um, these difficult and kind of unprocessed or unresolved conflicts and emotions inside of us, right? And like, as Peter Levine uh, writes in Unspoken Voice, um, it's when we start to organize our life around avoiding those uncomfortable feelings that trauma really begins to, uh, to kind of choke off our well-being and, uh, and exert more power on our life. And um, so how, I guess I'm, I'm wondering, how is it that we can um, make space to, that's safe for us to, 
uh, gently go and process like little bits at a time of that, of that trauma. And that's such a good question. And I think it'd be really interesting to hear what um, people in the group think, because it, it is a little bit of that journey of understanding. And often I've been asked, you know, why preventionists need to have a bit of understanding around trauma and trauma therapy, and not that they would go into doing that piece of work, but just having a bit of an awareness. So it'll be really interesting to hear if anyone um, through the chat, if uh, first, if everything in the video made sense, if you'd heard of normally, I think um, in that transition, they have, we normally hear of fight, fight, freeze, but we don't often hear of flop and friend in terms of trauma reaction. So are those new concepts to you in, in this group? Um, and then actually, how do we make sense of it and make meaning of it as well? So if you feel, feel free to pop in any things in the chat. And so the, these fundamental pieces of understanding as well of trauma is really what informs what's called trauma-informed care. And these are the, often some of the principles around trauma-informed care that are most commonly known. Um, oh, so someone has popped through that. They hadn't heard of friend or flop, so we might go into that a little bit more. Um, so maybe we'll go back to this for a second and just talk about friend or flop and then go into, um, into the principles of trauma-informed care. So um, the concept of flop is connected with um, freeze. And so often we talk about active freeze and passive freeze. So the difference is, um, you know, deer stunned um, in the headlights and is blocked, um, whereas flop is playing dead. So if you think of a cat playing with a mouse, um, it, it is um, a passive flop, so it's a way that the, the body and the brain thinks that actually if I am offer the least resistance, I have the most chance of survival. So that's often a, a piece um, to, that, that happens in terms of our like, instincts to try and respond to a threatening situation. Um, the friend is really interesting because it occurs a lot more when it's interpersonal violence. And, it, you know, there's other words that often get thrown around around um, Stockholm syndrome. So it's understanding that actually connection could increase someone's likelihood of survival. Um, and definitely we've um, seen those who have survived, um, uh, people who are, are serial um, um, murderers in particular that they might have been able to escape it through creating engagement and connection so there's um it's, it's a mitigating factor of if people see me and f connect with me I'm I might have a chance of, of creating safety around myself it's a very human instinct process and I can see a few participants just popping their hands up um, to get our attention it's easier if you use the chat or the Q&A box and let's just see um, uh, so yes, there is some um, clinical research around this and, I'd, and we can put it in the email at the end. Um, there's definitely some stuff in particular around sexual violence, around the friending and how that is a, quite a common uh, occurrence in interpersonal violence. So I'll make sure to add some uh, resources in the links for you. And I think that what, what we're talking about are responses in that crisis moment or in that traumatic moment. Um, and the, the reality is that the trauma, like it lives on beyond that and it lives on in the body, uh, beyond that moment. And that's what we're trying to be sensitive to when we're, when we're, um, being trauma informed as facilitators. Uh, like if you see an animal in the wild, almost get caught by a predator, but narrowly gets away. First thing the animal does when it gets out in the clear is shake off, right? It, it knows it needs to shake all those nerves out. Uh, of its body. And what happens in some of these forms of trauma response uh, for people is that we don't have that outlet for shaking it off. Um, and so we carry it in our body and then it manifests in, in different ways. Um, and, that's, and that's something that, that uh, as trauma-informed uh, facilitators that we'll see appear in groups. Um, and so being aware that that um, is a dynamic for folks and how can we be sensitive and skilled about the way we facilitate. Right. And that really ties us well into this next. So thank you, participants, for all your questions that have tied us well into the next section, because really that the core piece and why we're starting off with trauma is to figure out, you know, what is the response of people 
and how do we mitigate that in our action in particular when we're out in the community um, educating around these sensitive topics so these are the kind of key um, core principles of trauma-informed practice and there's a new one that's been added in recent terms, thanks to an intersection analysis. So the first one is safety. So um, often, and I really like um, Professor van der Kolk's um, definition of trauma as well, is that often there's sec someone's security system in the world and their alarm system has gone out of tilter and everything becomes a threat. So creating an embodied sense of safety um, as much as possible in the way we operate. So often in clinical settings, that might be from you know, the colour of the walls, the, you know, the soothingness of the environment is as important as the interaction with the human. So how do we create safe and comfortable spaces? The creation of choice, so ensuring that people feel that they have choice even um, and are aware of the choices that they have. And in education settings, that's really important around activities and giving information around activities. Collaboration, which is often the relational stance we have with people that we don't do to, we, we create with. Trustworthiness and transparency is I will do what I say and I'll be there. Um, if I say I'll be there and I'm transparent in the process and how I, um, how I operate in the world. And creating space for empowerment. Um, we can't empower others, but we can create space for, for others to act and develop. The last piece, which often isn't seen in trauma-informed practice, is around cultural, historical and gender issues. And that's really around understanding who we are in the world, the social cultural um, system, the systemic levels of oppression that might be at play, and how they might play out between us and those we're working with. John and Evan, anything you'd like to add around them? I think you covered everything. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I'm just noticing there's a question in the chat that I think yeah. kind of relates to this as well, oh. um, which is really useful to take to have in mind when we're starting to think about um, trauma-informed practices as facilitators. Um, the question, when my eyes can see it, um, around how long do kind of the fight, flight, freeze, flop, friend kind of stick around with people? Um, and is it during long-term or chronic tra trauma? So um, kind of yes and no. Um, it, it depends on each person and it also depends on um, the, the kind of healing um, journey that each person goes through. Um, but I guess, I guess a good way to think of it, or the way that I think of it when I go into um, practice or when I go into facilitate spaces, is that being trauma informed means that I have in mind that um, all of these kind of concepts, I'm pointing at things like you know, you can see what I'm pointing at, um, but all of the things on the screen around um, trauma informed practice um, help me to create overarchingly the safety in the room or holding the space in the room so that I can then, people can hear the messages they need to hear. But if somebody is, is triggered by something I said, um, often because I look like a big scary man um, with the beard, um, sometimes that can be, I, I have been told in the past that that can be triggering to see someone like myself walk in knowing that we're talking about um, sexual violence. Um, that that can be a trigger in and of itself um, for some people. But knowing how to, um, sometimes those responses are the things that can come back as well. Um, there's the fight, I always get this wrong, fight, flight, freeze, flop, friend. Um, any of those kinds of things can come into play. So being being aware of those sorts of um, responses to trauma um, actually helps us create spaces that are useful and effective um, when we're thinking from a trauma-informed lens. And I, and I think just linking into that is really thinking about if we're, we're talking about sexual violence prevention education, it's really acknowledging the endemic levels of harm already in our society that we can never... Um, you know, we can never assume that actually when we enter any space, we won't have someone with lived experience, whether it's lived experience of, you know, creating sexual harm or lived experience of, you know, the experience of um, sexual harm being received. So that's, that, that's where these principles are really useful, is we need to be thinking ahead, thinking about the content, thinking about how the content is going to be perceived and how we can support in that space. Um, and someone says that they felt really comfortable with you with a beard. <laughs> there you go, Jono. 
I'm glad, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and the conversation before around trauma um, and, and you know, how long it sticks around, I mean, that's always a million dollar question in many ways of um, no two people experiencing the same event will have a similar, exactly the same reaction. And that's what the video talked about is really dependent on someone's um, like history, you know, how, how many events of trauma, what's going on, um, what other positive factors that do they have in their life? Were they able to talk about it straight away? Were they not? Um, all of those elements come into, you know, how someone responds to a traumatic event. Um, and there's some really interesting uh, research around culture and PTSD, that more collectivist societies, not so much around intimate partner violence, but things like earthquakes and tsunamis actually recover from trauma a lot quicker because they connect with each other. And actually what, what increases some of the effects of trauma is the disconnection and the sense of isolation. So those are some of um, interesting thin, um, in, interesting themes. Um, one of the important kind of tools that gets, or models that gets used in a therapy setting that is useful to think about in a prevention and education setting is the window of tolerance. And basically what this says is that, you know, as humans, we have our lovely little window with the, um, with the beach and the ball in the middle here, which is where we feel comfortable, balanced, and we're okay and responding. And this is really important for us as professionals is where is our window of tolerance? Because if we're going into the community educating about these sensitive topics, we need to be, um, we need to know a bit about ourselves and we need to know how we, um, how we operate and, and what goes on. When people are outside of the window of tolerance is when um, and it can happen for a variety of reasons, but definitely with trauma, it's around that um, nervous system response that actually our nervous system is putting us either in a hyper arousal or hypo arousal. So hyper is anxious, out of control, anger, hypernant, and hyper arousal is more connected to decreased responsiveness, disassociation, um, feeling emotional numbness. And these are the kind of... Um, key uh, outside of the window of tolerance aspects. If we go back and the part of the use of therapy is figuring out how do we widen that window of tolerance um, for people so that people can stay more and more in that, in that regulated state. Um, anything either of you would like to add on the window of tolerance? I just see some questions popping through as well. Anything from either of you? Yeah, and I think I like this. I like the idea of tolerance because um, it's not like the ideal state means there's no stress, there's no conflict. The ideal state is when we have the ability to kind of stay present and connected to ourselves as we're dealing with uh, you know stress and, and conflicts and things like that. And that's that's that window. It's that space to be able to kind of hold and contain. Um, whatever life events come up. Yeah. Just some questions here around um, the trauma response and is it conscious and unco or unconscious? The reality of, um, so what we know in terms of trauma, which is also connected a little bit to the window of tolerance, is that people will, um, what happens is the thinking part of the brain, which was what the video showed. So the neocortex does get shut off. And that's because that part of the brain has evolved later and is very, a very slow problem solver and doesn't do very quick problem solving processes. And we'll be going a lot more in depth into this in um, part two. So there will be more in depth to this. Um, so and we'll be able to take lots of these questions and respond in part two. But I think um, there, part of it is that a lot of it is happening at an unconscious level because it's about our survival and it, the very quick decisions. So we're assessing lots of things around us to figure out what is the best strategy to keep ourselves safe. And sometimes it's what the best strategy is according to what I know and how I can operate in the world. Um, so if someone's experienced lots of trauma up until that point, their capacity, um, they will have 
only certain things available to them and be able to respond from that. So it's quite a complex piece and I'm going to contain some of these questions and bring them over to part two. So follow us for part two because we'll be um, having a chat with also a clinical psychologist and she'll be able to delve into some of these a little bit more in depth. So here is about, um, and going back to the tolerance, it's, it's, around, it's, it's around self awareness and developing and broadening our capacity to be able to respond to what's around us. Um, did we want to do the word cloud, Evan? Yeah, let's do it. So, so the question for you is how do you expand your window of tolerance? Um, what, do, what do you do? Um, in, whether it's in the form of, um, of self-care or other intentional practices that, um, that help you tolerate the stresses and expand that window of tolerance for yourself. So we'll drop the link. I, oh, it looks like it's there now. Uh, so the same way you'll click through and then we'll watch them pop up on the screen. Wow, lots of different examples, Aim. Eh? Yeah. It's going really, really big. Definitely exercise and breathing and meditation and yoga seem to stay core. Mm. So heaps of around connection as well, and being connected to others, not just necessarily other people, but places and divine spaces as well. Mm. Oh, sorry. thank you. Um, we've got another question um, around that friends seem to, I'll actually let you close this part of the session actually and we'll come, we'll leave lots of the questions around trauma to the end um, for everyone, just because um, I think we'll tie them up again next week, um, over the next couple of weeks, if that's okay with you as a group. So keep putting them in the chat box and in the question box, but we'll come to them in part two. So did you want to, anyone have any comments about the window of tolerance um, word cloud. Dono. Uh, I mean, it just, it's, it's fairly consistent. Um, I think what, what is, uh, good to kind of note in there is, is how much people were talking about connection. Um, Cause that's a little bit of our sales pitch later on around trauma informed uh, practice. So let's keep connection stuff in mind, I reckon. Evan? Yeah, um, I also noticed that there was folks um, being creative. I saw um, dance and music and journaling uh, all in there. And I think that that is the key eh, of um, everyone's journey around around life. It's going to be different. And mm -hmm. in particular, if we think of um, the role of the prevention educator, then that space is really not about getting into the clinical um, and and going into like the actually the therapeutic sense, but really staying in those positive, um, pro-social, uh, engaging ways that we can. Um, we can feel ourselves, get a sense of ourselves in the world and start grasping what's actually going on um, to gain mastery actually over um, 
our emotions and our feelings and our capacity to connect with others. So that's that's a journey really, um, regardless actually of someone's traumatic experience. And yes, we'll be able to do some slide shots of both the slides and of these word clouds because they are quite beautiful and very, um, this people, are, it's, 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 um, it's still going. So there's lots more being <laughs> added there. Cool. So, Jono, you are going to talk to us a little bit about this. Yeah. So, for many of um, many of you who are on today, um, Te Whare Tapafa, uh, uh, Dr. Mason Jury's uh, Māori model of, med of health and well-being will not be a new concept. Um, if it is, um, we're not going to dig into to dig into deep. Um, but uh, what what we oh, so Google's a really great resource for that. Um, however, if you Looking at this, what we kind of want to talk about is that um, with trauma-informed practice, we're really talking about holistic, holistically seeing people who are sitting in front of us, but also considering ourselves as whole beings as well um, and positioning ourselves within the, the work that we do. And the other side to that is that um, a lot of this is kind of more contemporary academic research that we might be thinking about. Um, but for a lot of us who come from indigenous backgrounds, um, especially down here in, in um, Te Moana Nui Akiba, um, this, this holistic view of the world and our interconnectedness between um, not only each other, but also the different aspects of ourselves um, is really grounded in um, our, our ancestral and indigenous wisdoms. Um, and it's, it's fairly, that's fairly consistent through a lot of indigenous communities throughout the world. So, um, I would, I would really encourage that we consider that there, are, there is knowledge outside of our traditional, sorry, traditional academic kind of view when we're starting to think about theories and practices and um, uh, uh, theoretical bases and really have a look into what, is, uh, what, is, what sits within indigenous knowledge. Um, like I said earlier, uh, cultural competence is a, is, tends, to, tends to be a tick box exercise I know that can be a controversial thing to say, um, and I say that as a social worker. Um, but that that can be a, a contra sorry that can be a tick box exercise for making sure that we meet some um, bare minimums. But what we really want to be doing is being um, uh, culturally relevant, um, and sometimes that means being able to draw on the knowledge that we bring with us from our some of, for some of us from our childhood experiences, from our cultural backgrounds and paradigms. Um, and start to bring forward some information, some some kind of knowledge uh, into the spaces that we uh, work in as well. I'm just seeing a question come forward. Someone shared with me what happens if your fale is round. Not all fales have four walls, so there are other. This this model is specifically from um, Del Maori, from a Del Maori perspective. Um, I know as a as a Samoan, we look we look at our fale and our fale are. Uh, ovular ovals <laughs> i think ovular is the wrong word um, they are ovals or they can be circles um, and there are ways that we can from within a Samoan context um, there's things like the fauna folly model um, there are other models from throughout the the pacific as well if you're looking at some of those other spaces the kakala model the um uh oh now that i'm thinking about them none of them are coming to my brain um, but there are other models of indigenous knowledge and framing of um, what holistic well-being looks like um, and the different aspects of, of our worlds and how we integrate them. So I would encourage everybody to go and look into those spaces. Um, but definitely knowing that the stuff that we're talking about also already sits in a lot of our, um, our uh, ancestral knowledge. Absolutely, and, and I think that's really important when we frame it around facilitation and guiding communities in complicated conversations is the, mas like the mastery of Indigenous practice really is around um, the practice of coming together. Like that is common practice of having conversations and dialogue. And for me, definitely some of the transformational pieces of my practice was I was very fortunate um, to be trained very early on here in Aotearoa by um, Joy Tiwiata and Russell Smith. And they had some really fundamental concepts of um, how Te Ao Māori could actually create that transformative piece of engagement. So that's really what we're trying to say here is that there's some great models um, 
of facilitation and really delve into what makes sense to you, your culture, and how you can be um, a person in this world guiding conversations. And this ties us into um, like th this work around facilitation is really connected to some critical pedagogy. So for those who don't know what pedagogy is, it's the how of teaching, not the what. Um, and if we're doing this work in our communities around education and um, facil facilitation of um, education programs around prevention, we really need to have a, a moment to think about who are what is the theoretical underpinning of our work? And um, when I came to Altera, I found it really interesting. The prevention service I was in didn't have any grounding in pedagogy. And I came from a pedagogical background back in Italy where that was um, the what I was studying at the time. And so these are um, some of our, author, well, our authors that we most connect with. Um, not all three at the same way, but the key point of critical pedagogy is that we're moving away from a banking system of education that the teacher knows all and gives to the students to a transformational experience. So those are the, that's probably Paulo Freire's key contribution that's articulated really well in his um, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which if you haven't read and are doing education in the community, I, I think all three of us would highly recommend that. Would, uh, would others agree? I get nods, sweet. Um, and, and that's really what he talks about. Graham Smith is a um, Kopapa Māori pedagogist and talks a lot about Kopapa Māori um, transformational experiences and was around the um, development of Kuta Kopapa. Um, and Bell Hooks is a feminist pedagogist and she talks a lot about love and pedagogy, which I know, Jono, we were talking a bit offline around um, that concept and principle of love and education and transformation. Do you want to add that in here? Sure. Um, I, th I think a lot of the time in, in helping services or helping spaces or I haven't, I still, I'm personally, I'm still working on the language I use to refer to the work that we, we all do because um, I don't like talking about clients and things like that. But anyway, side notes. Um, I know that there's, there can be a lot of discomfort around talking about having love or loving your um, the people that you work with, um, whether that's your colleagues or if you're walking into a classroom and, ha and having or showing love to your, um, your, the young people that you're working with in that room. But I think from an Indigenous perspective, from a Samoan, from a, um, a Moana perspective, where we're really framing love, it's not quite the same as like having, like being in love with someone. Um, it's the aloha, the aroha, the aloha, the aroha, offer all of those kinds of words um, they don't talk about like romantic I mean they do talk about romantic love at times but what they are really talking about is this love that is um, about kindness and compassion and empathy and connection um, and that's a really important uh, way to talk about you know you may hear things like heart-centered practice or um, love-centered practice if we start putting it we're in Aotearoa, let's, let's start using this, the knowledge of our peoples down here. Um, if we start talking about aroha-centered practice, um, aloha, aroha, uh, aloha, ofa, aroha, um, or the Proto-Polynesian Proto words, if you want to get fancy, arofa, um, that, that kind of knowledge is, um, is, the, is the kind of space that kicks off transformational experiences. Um, so that people can really pick up the, the transfer of knowledge. Um, Dr. Manu Lanimaya, who is an indigenous epistemological theorist from Hawaii. Oh my gosh, so many big words. Um, but Dr. Manu Lanimaya talks about um, that truth is the highest knowledge and love is the highest truth. Um, and I believe she... Uh, she has taken that from um, indigenous Hawaiian knowledge. Um, but that, that I think fits really well when we start talking critical pedagogy and, and working with our communities. Yeah. Cool. Um, 
this we'll, we'll skim over the next ones just to get into some of the practical tools but this is really to say that participation um is key and that if you've ever been in a uni lecture theater and not learned anything afterwards that's completely normal um because that is the least we we learn like the the the, the, the it's not the best way of learning. And I think um, the transformational model is really, we learn best when we're vibrating and fully engaged in anything we do. That's when we're at the peak of learning. And the very peak is when we're actually teaching others. Um, so that's kind of your learning edge as an educator in the community is where, um, where we can learn the most. And we'll... Um, I'm just mindful of time, um, if that's okay with both of you, if I can just talk to these and we'll give these out actually as a more in-depth resource. Um, but actually, we probably have time for Jonna to talk more about this, this part, don't we? I think so. Let's go for it. <laughs> Sorry, so, oh, also, I was trying to type things and be cool into the chat, but instead I sent it directly to you, Miriam, and nobody else. <laughs> Um, okay, so in terms of what young people told us, so um, a few years back uh, was uh, part of um, the kind of uh, research team looking at what would be useful um, in terms of a sexual violence preventionist or a facilitator uh, from a young people's perspective, specifically my, my part was looking at young men's perspectives. Um, and at the end of the day, essentially all of this stuff is what came out. But if you if you boil it down, it's knowing, being able to know things about what we're talking about, being knowledgeable in that space. Actually, I think it comes a lot back to that um, systemic review of the um, primary prevention, all of those key learnings and key outcomes. Essentially the same sort of thing came from, our young, from the words of our young people. Um, the, the biggest, I think for me, the, the, the actual biggest learning there was knowing about a bit, it's important for us to, as preventionists or as facilitators, that our kind of number one job is to hold space, to see here and um, to see and hear our young people who are in the room, um, to, but also to be able to call them out when they're kind of pushing those boundaries. So I was trying to think of a, a good way to say that <laughs> when they're pushing the boundaries. Um, but when we do that call out, uh, call out or call in work, um, that what we're doing is we're asking for critical reflection um, and saying, actually, here's the boundary. Um, I'm not telling you off, but I am saying this is the boundary of what's what's appropriate, what's not okay, what's okay, all of those kinds of things. Um, that again, uh, role models the kind of the content that we're really talking about. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm also aware of time. I don't want to take up too much time. No, no. And I think that's, um, I think that was a really valuable piece of work that we did with young people. Uh, and John and I were directly involved around, um, you know, really talking to them about what they needed from us as facilitators. And it's so important to ask our communities when we're doing this work, what, what is it that they actually need from us? Um, so yeah, and it was just such a pleasure. Well, we had quite a lot of fun. So the we did three focus groups, but the first one was actually young people design the questions of the other focus groups. So it was a co-design process with young men in particular, and we just talked to young men because for us um, in particular with sexual violence work, really we're trying to transform patriarchal culture. And so how do we really enlist and in, engage with um with young men and figure out how do we do this work because lots of this work has stemmed from a feminist woman's world um, and how do we actually start shifting some of our own cultural dynamics um, of where this work has stemmed from so it was a lot of fun um, and great to great to get young people directly involved in anything so now we're going to spend the last section of actually looking at, at going into what this looks like in action and the first piece is about um, knowing ourselves. So really all that journey as well that we've done, gone on in terms of understanding our window of tolerance and um, looking at different cultural models is who are you um, and who are you in the world and how well are you, what is your journey of healing and what is your limits of practice? Um, so... I suppose, would it be useful if each of us actually talked a little bit about 
how you started to hold yourself accountable in this work? Mm. Going to chuck, chuck a good question to you both. I can start us off. So if I think of myself in this work, for me, it's really like I was very fortunate when I um, when I started doing the work when I was a teenager of having elders that could hold me accountable, especially when I was doing radical things that made no sense of having someone that kept drawing me back to what's the purpose of what you're doing and why are you doing it? And that was embedded to, in me really, really young um, and helped me create a sense of safety. I think with limits of practice, it was more useful later in my life to actually have some clinical people around me, in particular with prevention work of going, and now you're across the line in terms of your practice um, because you're, go, you're opening up cans of worms that you don't know how to manage. Um, and I think that's really important to think of, you know, what is your capacity, clinical skill and understanding, and then what are you opening up in a group and can you actually manage what you've just opened up? And I definitely help, um, what helped me a lot was studying psychodrama for three years um, and really getting to a deeper understanding of group work and group facilitation. What about others? David? I can, I connect with what you're saying, Miriam, because I also started getting involved in this work as a teenager um, and, in, and in the theater space as well. And I think for me, a big part was like owning who I am. Cause a lot of times when I was in these spaces, they were mostly women in the space. Like most of the time I'm the only guy there. And so, um, and we're doing drama stuff. So I was always playing somebody's abusive boyfriend, father, um, whatever, and learning how to hold that, but also seeing that as like a certain medicine for me to understand um, like what aspects of patriarchy I had in me was kind of what I'd hold in myself as I held that role that was allowing me to help somebody work through their story. Um, and that um, being able to, I guess I, I thought of it as like kind of bitter medicine, like being able to kind of burn through some of that um, rigidity, I guess, that I would have about my own privilege, whether that's my um, white American privilege or my male privilege, allowed me to be more comfortable with who I am. So then I can use that in the room um, so that I can just show up who I am as I am in relationship to the systems of power, in relationship to the issues that we're talking about and hold space. And then I agree also the second layer was about this understanding um, like different tools to regulate um, emotion in the space and not, not go beyond what I could um, late, like I, I realized later, I guess, that sometimes people, they want to share something or disclose something, but they don't feel safe. So they wait until the last minute and then they bring it up and then the bell rings and they can walk out or whatever. So really framing, learning how to frame things so that I know that that's brewing for somebody in the space and I create enough like um, cushion around whatever questions I ask. And if my class gets cut too short, then I'm not even going to go there uh, around certain things. Um, and I think that's, that's the knowing your limits part. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think for me, there's, um, I just, as you were talking, I think there's also that piece of being able to hold myself and have a really clear understanding of where I start and end so that I yeah. can be, be able to see where the students start, where, where the people in the group start and end, and really be able to distinguish what's my story and what's theirs. What is, what am I, or what is it that's actually mine and I'm projecting onto them? And what is it that I'm actually listening and feeling and getting an, a body sensation of what's going on in the group? Um, and I think that's the beauty of group work in some ways. And someone in the group um, in the chat just commented of that, that piece of walking the talk um, which is a journey in itself of how do we actually unpack <laughs> fully, um, you know, all the, you know, power and control culture that we live in to actually be able to role model this in, um, yeah, in, in this work. I was, oh, sorry, I was just going to say something really quickly um, to that as well, that um, in me kind of learning how to do this work uh, when I was, coming up um, and I feel like I'm still coming up uh, is that 
um, first I started with trying to know my limits and then realized actually you'd need to figure out your own self. Um, but for me, it's, I find it becomes an, an, a, like a simultaneous process of um, as you know yourself more, you find out your limits. As you grow and develop, it becomes a fluid. Knowing yourself becomes this ongoing journey. Um, and therefore, your limits are continually expanding or contracting. Um, so th even over the, sometimes over the course of actually standing in a room and facilitating something, um, being aware of that is a, is a hugely um, beneficial kind of component to, to or tool in your toolbox of practice um, that sometimes your limits might change over the course of an hour um, depending on what's happening in the room as well so yeah. you know kind of being nice with yourself about that and, and knowing when to push but also when to take um, take a step back and go actually I need to just sit with this for a bit and co-facilitation is a great idea because then you can pass over and be like Anything else to add? Call facilitator, my brain has stopped working. Help me. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. And that process of co-facilitation, but also organisational support. So you, um, we can't do this work in isolation um, at all. Like we need to be in a space that can hold us accountable, that gives us supervision, that if we've, um, you know, if something's gone wrong, that we have safe, um, capable and competent people that we can go back to and unpack that. And ideally that this, this journey of learning facilitation around sexual violence prevention education is done in an apprenticeship model um, where we can be, we can shadow those who are more experienced so that, you know, so if, if we get ourselves stuck that someone can, you know, take the shovel off us and stop us digging a hole <laughs> and, and contain the group at the same time, because it, it is, Ideally, we, you know, people come trained to this um, or that we have a very, very good apprenticeship model that ensures the safety of our communities and our group first and foremost, um, because we can't, we can't be doing our work on the backs of those we're actually there to serve. Um, we need to be taking responsibility for that ourselves. Yeah, and, the, and the best time for supervision is before you need it. So it's better to just have supervision regularly um, rather than looking for it in a, only in a crisis. Yeah, absolutely. Big fans of supervision. <laughs> <laughs> so if we think of trauma-informed practice in action, um, lots of it is about thinking ahead. As, as everyone was saying, you know, don't do supervision when you need it, plan before. The same is with all of the parts of your education program. Not, ideally, we are uh, planning and preparing everything beforehand and thinking into actually what is needed in the group. Um, so we had lots of words on here and we decided to actually make this into a handout that you will get in terms of thinking, what do you need to do before you go to a group, during and afterwards? So that's a very comprehensive handout that will be in your email um, after this presentation. But um, Evan, we really talked strongly about connect before content and just wondering if you can bring this to life in terms of um, what we're meaning by this. Yeah, for sure. I, mean, I think that the first thing first, and this, this connects with what you were talking about, John, right? Like it's love. And so we want to walk in and establish that connection first. And once you feel that in the room, people can, can relax and then they can engage with whatever they feel comfortable, they feel safe, um, then we can go into whatever else. But if I, if I haven't kind of dropped in yet, then I'm not going to be kind of learning or growing from whatever else happens from the content after that. And I think sometimes, especially in the school settings where everything feels so rushed and compressed, we, we might feel the urge to skip over that fucka fanangatanga, but um, it's actually such an important piece of what we do. And as a lot of you said in the word cloud, that is the part of it that helps you expand your window of tolerance. Um, just remembering that. Absolutely, and it's it's all the pieces also going into a class. So often, if I when I would go and educate, for me, a piece of a fundamental connection is connecting with the the teacher so as you're walking to the classroom 
you know, learning who this teacher is, how are we going to work together? Do they know um, me? Do they know, do I know them? Um, and really building that safety as well with the teacher of going, this is when I need you to step in. This is when I might not need you to step in. But also thinking about this teacher is the person who's going to be there for the students when I leave. If I'm a guest in a community setting, if I'm not going to be there um, once this session is over, what is the safety for the, the group that I'm, that I'm engaging with? So building that relationship is key, um, both in terms of them feeling that they can contact your organisation afterwards and having that journey together. Um, yeah, any, anything else either of you wanted to say around that? Um, I like I like talking about it as thinking about your place in the ecosystem of that mm -hmm. young person, um, because then it, it starts grounding you in a in a connection level right from before you even walk into the the school or walk into the room. Um, you're starting to think about your place and your role um, as a facilitator of sexual violence prevention education um, to within that kind of ecosystem of their education system, the communities they live in, um, their, their, their teaching staff or whoever their support staff look like, um, potentially even like their family and their friends and the people that are actually around them, um, kind of it helps to remind you of, okay, I don't have to be, be the person that fixes everything for this young person who might be in distress or for this young person who's sitting in the room with a 10 billion questions that I can't answer everything. Um, but rather that I'm part of, I'm a, I'm a piece of the puzzle. Um, and maybe my role is to be able to go, hey, you know that there's places that you can seek more support or more information from. Yeah. Um, which is really helpful as a facilitator rather than a therapist. And it's about that container, so it's giving people the heads up. So if we think about trauma-informed care, it's about giving people choice um, so that, and giving being trustworthy that they know what's coming up and creating safety within that. So it's saying, this is the session, this is what we're going to do, this is how it's going to go, so that there's no surprises, so that those who have lived experience in the room can figure out how to adjust themselves. Because I think often we forget that also trauma survivors are very resilient. Um, they, they've they been surviving in the world um, up until this point before we came into their life. So, you know, um, but they do need some information around what might be coming up. Um, and also always giving those, um, so in some programs they don't give um, help seeking information until um, session three, that's way too late. Um, I normally give it at the beginning of the session and at the end. Every single session that we do is reminding and just role modeling that it's really normal to us for help and seek help. Um, and also making sure that there is some space at the end of each session where people can stick around and ask questions and that you've got some space for that as well. So this is an activity just to give everyone the heads up that we're going to do. Not everyone might want to do it because we will get you to be thinking a little bit about yourself. But this is a, a, to get you um, to give an understanding of of how we can have an impact as a facilitator. So we'll be getting you to think about different states and it will be connected to your parents. So if you don't feel like thinking about your parents, um, you can avoid doing this activity and we will do a, a bit of a transition activity afterwards so we don't leave anyone with unpleasant feelings. The concept that we're getting at is group warm up. And it's a really important um, drama methodology. So it comes from psychodrama. And it's um, a powerful understanding of your role as a facilitator and what you say impacts where the group goes. So we're going to start this activity if everyone can um, get themselves comfortable. And if you don't want to participate, that's absolutely fine. And you can pull out at any time. So what I would like you all to think about is the stereotypical or typical parents in our societies. Who are they? What do they do? Just create an image of that. How, how busy are they? How frantic are they? How loving are they? What comes to your mind in that stereotypical, typical level of being a parent? Just feeling into that. The next level is, so mostly on this group, I'm assuming that we are adults. Um, I don't think there's any teens online, but positioning yourself in the role of you as a parent, 
or you as a potential parent if you're not yet as a parent. And if you never want to be a parent, how that feels as well, being asked to think about that role. So the next step down is you in the here and now with your parents. So just feel the shift around that. And then you with your parents at the time before. And just feel that for a little bit. We won't leave people there too long because that might be uncomfortable for some. Okay. So that's a good example of an activity that for some might have brought up some quite important stuff. So not everyone had a great experience of being with their parents at four. And so when we're talking about these things in our community and us and, and talking about sensitive topics, we always need to get a feel and it's really hard to do online. So I'm going to assume that for some that wouldn't have gone so well. So we're going to do straight away of bringing ourselves back into the window. Um, and normally we can do this with what's called group state changes. Um, and what um, what we normally give in terms of group state changes is a couple of options. So it's also role modeling that people might want choice um, around how they bring themselves back into the window of tolerance. Um, and also that not every state changer will work for everyone because breathing, meditation, mindfulness for those with complex or with some people with trauma can actually be quite, um, quite scary. So you've got two options, which you can figure out. Um, one is a breathing exercise, which you breathe in for four seconds, hold for four seconds and out for four seconds. Um, and you can do that, we'll let you do that for 20 seconds. The other one is a grounding activity where you can name th five things that you can see, four things that you can hear, three things that you can feel, two things that you can smell. So these are two simple activities that you can do in a group as well. So you at home might have a different way you want to bring yourself back to a state of calm. Oh. So I can see some people are adding in the comment and in the chat other things that they use like in the grounding with young people that they add a thing that they can taste a thing that they're grateful for and a thing about themselves um, so having a multitude of little activities like these is really important the purpose of this activity is to really understand what we say and where that sends people so with uh, and it's really around the contract we have with a group if you're going in, and if we pair this up with the socio-ecological model, we are in general not wanting to talk to young people about them and their past or them in the here and now with their relational experiences because we're moving into a therapeutic setting and we're opening up potentially cans of worms that we might not be, um, if we are uh, <clears throat> not trained as therapists, we're not equipped to be doing, but also it's not the contract of the group. We are there to do an education program. And so we're really trying to explore the societal and community level of them as a citizen engaging with these societal norms that inform sexual violence. Um, how, how do they understand it and what goes on? So it's as simple as instead of asking people, what do you think? What do people think? And so we're opening it up constantly to the broad and the generic so that allows people to engage, participants to engage from that perspective. That, that, you know, they can also be a bit playful and say things that they might not think, but they know others think. Um, where we might want them to actually engage with them as themselves, so in that community level, is them as a bystander. So how can they help in a situation that they're seeing that is not okay? Where we want to try and avoid is 
putting young people in the position of someone who's been harm or harmed or someone who is harmful in a group education activity. Where it gets a bit blurry is if people are doing self-defense. And I think in terms of trauma-informed facilitation, we have to be actually quite careful around self-defense activities. Usually when they're done in quite fun ways, that can mitigate some of the triggering for people. But actually we need to think that um, do, and I'm, part of my um, background is a self-defense teacher. So it's, that is a very delicate space to be in, especially with um, children and young people that have already experienced harm, is that, that we're, we're re-putting them in a place that is known to them and potentially doesn't make sense of why they're having to re-experience that. So having some good um, thinking about how you do that. Would you, either of you have anything you'd like to add on this? Hey, you did great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so really thinking about what you're saying and where you're sending people and what are you opening up. Um, shall I go through this and then hand over to you, Evan, around? Yeah. So the yeah. other piece um, in terms of trauma-informed practice and also good facilitation is about saying, um, really stating activities. So giving the rationale, explaining the task, defining the context and explain what needs to be reported back, monitor and debrief. So sometimes I, I find new facilitators um, can get com, um, quite flustered in giving instructions and, it, and it, you know, they've lost the group within the first five seconds. So really slowing that down and thinking, what are you actually asking the group to do? But within that trauma-informed context, being very clear and specific around what's expected, what are their opt-out options, um, and being really clear that not everyone has to participate. Lots of our prevention programs do have role-playing, and generally when we start role-playing, people um, often dislike role-plays and go, ugh, we hate role-plays. Um, and often my experience is people hate role-plays because they aren't facilitated well, and they're actually unsafe. And we're asking people to jump into a situation that um, they don't know what it actually is. So um, the easiest way we can create a really safe role play is by setting the scene. And so part of that is that we're bringing the scene to life so that people know what's expected of them and they're not just volunteering into a dark space that then they're going to be chucked into some weird scenario that they have no idea about. So the idea is before you actually ask anyone to volunteer, you would say, you know, we're going to practice something like responding to a friend that's not doing so well or, you know, listening to a friend that's not doing so well. Where are we? You know, where would... Um, Typically, a friend talk to another friend. What's happening? So how does this encounter occur? Who is in the scene? And then who would like to give it a go? Now, that's role modelling informed consent because people know exactly what it is that they're participating in. So we're trying not to ever create situations where we're tricking participants into doing something because that's not role modelling good consent and good communication. I'm going to hand it over to you, Evan. All right. And we'll talk about um, forum theater. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with um, the Theater of the Oppressed and Augusto Boal, but um, his work in Brazil, he, he developed a form of theater with the idea that much, he was really building off of Frere's pedagogy of the oppressed and saying that um, you know, people, they have the resources and the power to solve their own problems. So it's just our job to facilitate that, right? And I think that that actually fits really well with what we're talking about in terms of, um, of prevention, right? So it's not, not so much theater with a message as it is kind of theater with a question. Go to the next slide. So, so one of the key ideas here is that <clears throat> there is no... There's no actor and spectator difference. Um, Boal said, anyone can act, even actors. But we have this idea that an actor plus a spectator is a spect actor. We both have the ability to act and observe in our daily life. And we'll go to the next one. Um, so, so in forum theater, the kind of role play scene 
uh, is called an anti-model. And an anti-model contains a problem, right? So you've got the, the protagonist, the person who's facing that problem. You've got um, the antagonist who could be a person or a group of people or even a social system that's the source of that problem, the source of that oppression. And you've got the inactive bystander who's, who's witnessing uh, and could be a potential ally in that situation, but has not been activated um, to act in that way. Right? The joker is our facilitator. Now, <clears throat> you can set this up like how Miriam described. Let's say you set it up and, um, and it's a violent situation or it's like kind of a moment of aggression. Well, then we have to use other tools as a facilitator to um, rewind it. Like what happened before that? Um, and in order to find the space where it's actually safe for us to be role playing and, and engage in that. Um, doing role plays with moments of aggression, like the hand about to slap or something. Um, it, it's only really like a self-defense exercise. It's not as much an exercise in um, critical thinking and deconstructing um, the social forces. So Bawal would say, um, we're using theater to fight oppression, not aggression. And so you need to keep asking that question, what happened before? Till we find that space where it's safe for us to deconstruct the situation and, and do the primary prevention work um, of, of looking at that. So, so here, the, you're asking people to kind of role play. You're asking them to role play that bystander position and say, how do you activate that third person um, who's there, who's sympathetic potentially, but not, um, not actively engaging to interrupt the injustice that they witness? Um, and bystander intervention is, is a very popular approach in, in the primary prevention space. Um, I think that the key here is, is to remember with trauma that for some people, there's a pull to repeat, right? And some people identify with the perpetrator and some people would identify as a victim or survivor. So being aware of the people who are in those um, protagonist and antagonist roles and the emotional, um, I guess, intensity for them. So you want to be tracking that as a facilitator because you don't want someone to lose, to fall out of the play, right? For it to all of a sudden become real for somebody or have them reliving it. Um, and I think especially when you are working with um, younger folks who have less um, impulse control, they can use a bit more containment, um, whether that's kind of more instructions or more distance between the characters on stage um, or whatever conventions you're using in order to ensure safety as you're kind of continually tracking the, the emotional state, knowing that, um, that trauma is in the room and it is in the lived experience of the people who are there. So when we role play this, this stuff, the emphasis on the bystander, not these other two because of the intensity and, and you're constantly the kind of the most curious person in the room paying close attention. I love that definition of being the most curious person in the room in terms of, um, uh, yeah, in terms of the facilitator, like we have to be, you know, really tracking everything that's going on. And yes, um, there are um, many that use upstand instead of bystander, um, and that's um, and that's fine for young people if they understand the difference. I don't think that changes in terms of the model here around wh which role we're positioning young people in, um, in terms of role playing and playing with. And I find um, using action methods with young people and with with communities in general really helps that playfulness as long as they're constructed really well and really safely yeah so great to have that so the fundamental shift in terms of trauma-informed facilitation and then this is ties in also to what we're going to be doing in part two which will be looking more at the behaviors in the room so today was really about how we structure and contain and um, support a session and next time we'll be looking at really looking at more of the behaviors that we should be watching out for is that trauma-informed facilitation moves our attention from what is wrong with you to what has happened to you and this is the fundamental shift what is the story of your behavior what is going on with you and i find in particular with um those who have um who educate in our community sometimes get caught up with the behaviors of our participants and um and so we, we get dragged back into what is wrong with you um, because that's actually a fundamental um, 
that is fundamentally what our society teaches us is a, a, a often in terms of those dominant western discourses is that if people behave in us in a way that's not appropriate there's something fundamentally wrong with them and that's tied into a lot of historical stuff um and this really ties into um why should sexual violence preventionists be trauma informed and know enough about trauma is because actually the system we're going into in terms of schools um, fail our survivors and those with lived experience routinely because mm -hmm. lots of the education model stems from this what is wrong with you um, uh, paradigm instead of what has happened to you. So having worked both in the prevention world and the crisis world, going into a school even after, after you know, school programs go in, and seeing the school response to a survivor in terms of them, you know, doing behavior that from a trauma response, from a trauma understanding is very normal. You know, they're just a traumatized young per per person and the whole system is demonizing them as attention seeking or, you know, doing things that um, isn't useful and what is wrong with them. So this is where we can start bringing into a system new ways of thinking and that can really help shift some of the narratives around these behaviours. And, um, well, sorry, the narratives around our attitudes towards people that have experienced trauma. So that's um, part of the fundamental shift that we're trying to achieve, as well as us being, you know, there and responsive to those with lived experience and our community and role modelling, um, actually what it's going to take to end sexual violence. And I think either of you would add to that. Eric, you covered that pretty well. <laughs> Just trying to think. Yeah, nice. So that brings us to the end of our session. Um, today was slight uh, was booked in for an hour and a half, and these are the kind of we tried to do a brief introduction of prevention, understanding trauma, trauma informed facilitation, what it looks like in action. Um, this is you know is a lot to cover, and really what we want to emphasize is this is not enough for you to go into the community and educate, um, so don't feel that this has ticked a box and now you can fly solo, and hopefully um, uh, hopefully that is a key message that um, came through before when we talked about limits. I am just going to put in the, uh, in the chat an evaluation form for you all to fill out, so please do that before you leave. Um, and do sign up for session two, which is on the 24th. It's going to be an hour and a half again. Um, and it's going to just, you know, go a little bit more deeper into both the trauma aspect, behavior and developmental needs of young people around trauma. So there are lots of thanks in the session, um, in the chat. So um, we'll, I'll just bring up our thank you slide and maybe uh, stop the share just so we can connect with each other as it's kind of we're, we're small little boxes on the side now we can actually see each other and see the chat better um so thank you to you both for today lots of thanks coming through the chat any last comments and reflections i think we've managed to answer most of the questions and all the questions about um trauma will i'll bring into this part two so if you feel that some of the stuff around trauma hasn't been responded to what we'll go deeper in part two so please come back and join us. But anything you two would like to say to help wrap us up? Um, thank you for having me. Um, I'm glad that I could be useful uh, to everyone that joined us today. Um, uh, specifically, thank you to um, to Miriam and to your Hakia Hine National Network for ending sexual violence together. Um, for opening this space and, and holding these conversations, I think they're really um, they're really vital uh, and things that I would have loved to have had um, when I first started working in sexual violence prevention. Um, thankfully, I had Miriam to kind of be like, Miriam, help. <laughs> um, Evan, Evan, it's been awesome to meet you and hopefully one day we can meet in person. Yeah, I hope so. I, and I echo, I echo that. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam and, and Tones for putting this together. And I also thank you to all the participants who do this work because it, it is really um, important work. And thank you for kind of investing the time in your own professional development and growth um, on this journey. And I hope this is just the beginning. Yeah, I, I would echo that, Evan. Firstly, it's um, for me, it's always a 
pleasure to hang out with um, great minds and great facilitators. So I've really enjoyed the process of getting to today's session and um, and having those quite in-depth conversations. I, I love nerding out on pedagogy and facilitation. That's one of my um, things I do for fun. <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah and i've i've absolutely loved the engagement in the chat you know there's a lot of a, a lot of deep practice actually coming through in terms of um people's desires and and real commitment to our communities and i think that for me is the key aspect of this work is if we're going to be doing prevention um we are in service to our communities and in many ways and and that's a real privilege to be in that space that um, our communities open up their doors and welcome us in um so honoring that space and honoring it in a way that we continue to be trustworthy and we continue to show up and and keep making this world a better place i think is um is what really drives me in this work. So um, thank you for both um, for sharing this hour and a half and um, thank you to all of you for sharing with us. So if that feels like a good space to end, um, we'll close with a karakia and wish you all well on your day. Mary? Yeah. Do you mind if I close with karakia? Is that Absolutely. all good? Absolutely. Go for it. Mm. Cool. Uh, me karakia tata. Mā te rā e kawe mai te ngoi a rā i a rā. Mā te marama e whakaora i a koe e waingapō. Mā te ua e horo i au mā harahara. Mā te hau e pupuhi te pākau kahu ki roto i tō tinana. I roto i o hikoitanga i te ao, kia whakaaro koe ki te humari a tā kua ki o au rā. Ake, ake, haumi e hui e tā i ki e. Kakite anō, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and we will catch up soon. Kia ora.